So if your chains aren't broken, what are you waiting for? Good to see you today. Man, what a great day we had yesterday at our Men's Wild Game Feast. Somebody ought to shout a little louder than that. Had close to 200 men at that game feast. I know some of y'all thought Lenny Zone was crazy and Mr. Zahn had to be out of his mind. He told you going to be 200 men there, but somebody's praying. Amen, Lenny. So, it's a great day in the Lord, great time. That wild game feast, just took only a few years, every year it gets a little larger, a little larger, a little larger. So it keeps growing like that. I don't know where we're going to have room to put it at. Amen. But it was a great, great day in the Lord. You who attended, you who brought friends. Praise the Lord for your faithfulness to be a good friend like that and take people to hear the gospel. We had men come to know Christ. A lot of men get right with God. It was just a great, great time in the Lord. So if you were there, you got to know what it was like. If you weren't there, man, make plans next year because it really gets richer, fuller, and more, more powerful every year that we do it. So praise the Lord for that. Amen? Amen? Today we're continuing our series of messages. So let's get down to business about taking care of business. And taking care of business, we've been talking about several things. The first message we dealt with had to do with taking care of our business of experiencing God in our lives. What kind of person do we have to be if we're really going to know the power of God on our life and experience God in our life? And we talked about brokenness. We talked about uh, a hungry heart, a teachable spirit from the book of Malachi. And then we talked about the business of generosity in our life. Learning how to be the kind of people who aren't expecting to get all the time. Learning to be givers. Learning to participate. Learning to... to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And last week we talked about uh, the business of our families. What does the Bible have to say about that? And what does the Scripture have to say about it? And today, I'm going to take it another step and talk about uh, the business of relationships. And uh, understanding that we are relational people, that God made us to be relational people. And God Himself is a relational God. He's God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And there's perfect fellowship and friendship and unity within the, within the Trinity. And God said, let us make man after our own image, after our own likeness, and let's give him authority in the, in the earth. The idea there, part of that was the fact that God made us in his likeness in regard to relationship. He told Adam, one of the first things, it's not good for you to be alone. And how important that relationships are in our life. And sometimes we, we do not give the, uh, I think, the commitment to understanding relationships that we really ought to do it. And therefore, I think that we suffer in a lot of ways. There's a passage in Proverbs that says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I used to think that meant, you know, I'm supposed to fight with my brothers, but that's not what it means, all right? means that he helps in times of adversity. But friendship's an important thing. The Bible has a great deal to say about it. Again, because we are these relational creatures and there's something about us that uh, reaches out and wants to be a part of. And in fact, I believe of all the desires that God built into our life, uh, there's this one that's very, probably one of the strongest desires and drives of our life, and that's to be a part of something, to be, to be loved, to be accepted, to, to join in. Uh, we call this church Believer's Fellowship. Because it's all about the family of God learning how to have that koinonia that the Greek word is, that fellowship of, of, of the gospel, the fellowship of Christ, the fellowship of being the body of Christ. And uh, we have this desire to, to want to be a part of something. Now, we're all, we're all born with that. And as I said, it's probably one of the strongest desires that we have in all of our life, that, that, the desire for acceptance. Uh, some people translate it into other things. It becomes a, the desire to be popular. Now we're living in this celebrity age, aren't we? Where we have all these, these uh, talent shows on and all these uh, 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 real-life kind of TV things where everybody wants to be a celebrity, everybody wants to be the idler, everybody wants to be the voice or famous, you know, want to be recognized. This, this is my dream, to be recognized. And if, you want to, if that's your dream, then just be on one of those shows, you'll get it crushed real quick. But uh, anyway... Uh, there's just something about us that wants to be a part of it. And if we do not understand that and we don't learn how to, to harness that and bring it into submission to Jesus Christ, then we'll end up in all the wrong places with all the wrong people doing all the wrong kind of things. Uh, reading some definitions of friendship this last week, some were kind of interesting, like Irma Bombex. She said, a friend is somebody who doesn't go on a diet when you're fat. I'll let you think about it a minute. In other words, a friend is someone who knows all about you and still loves you. Uh, in fact, there was a newspaper that put out a, a co competition for the best definition of friendship. Here's what came back. A friend is someone who's walking in when everybody else is running out. Yeah. And ain't that the truth, amen? But we are relational beings. Now, that's, it's, it's not like it used to be in our culture. In fact, there was a USA Today article that came back about six years ago, and it said that it was titled Lonely Americans. 
And it says Americans have fewer uh, friendships than, than they have in the past. And it goes on to say, lonely Americans have a third fewer close friends and confidants than they did 20 years ago. A sign people may be living lonelier, more isolated lives than in the past. Went on to say in 1985, the average American had three people in whom they could genuinely confide in, you know, about the important matters in their life. Three people that they could genuinely lay out their heart to without being afraid of repercussions. And they said in 2002, in that period of time from 85 to 2002, uh, 2004, excuse me, that that changed from three people to two people that they could really talk to. In fact, the article went on to say that 25% of Americans have no confidence, uh, confidence at all, people they can really trust, and they would call their closest friend and ally. And the article went on to make some excuses and tell us why the reasons were that, you know, that the families have a, uh, that uh, are not as close as they used to be. Uh, uh, so many times there's one-parent families. Uh, uh, sometimes it, it, you know, it's, it's part of the culture we live in where everybody puts their, their headphones on and their hoodies up and kind of lives isolated lives and don't want to talk. We, we, as we said before, we don't have front porches anymore. We're not as relational as orientship as we, we, we just don't think we need other people. And unfortunately, that's just part of the times of the technological age that we live in. People just withdraw. But what I want to talk about today is this, this importance of friendship. And even more important than that is how to choose your friends and why it's important that you choose your friends. In fact, we'll look at about four things today, you know, uh, in, in that regard. If you go to the Bible, there's some great, great relationships and stories of friendship throughout the Word of God. There's a story of Ruth and there's that, that powerful uh, pledge uh, between Ruth and Naomi as, uh, as, as they're going back to Naomi's homeland when Ruth says, you know, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you for where you go, I will go and where you lodge, that's where I'll lodge and your people shall be my people. And your God shall be my God. That's friendship. That's a close knit friendship. And there's other stories and relationships you go through scripture. And by the way, there's tons. I, I'm just going to name a few. David and Jonathan those historical relationships. There's Saul who, who's become jealous and envious and bitter at David. And uh, uh, he hates David now with, with pure and passion, driven by demons. But yet his son is just the opposite. Uh, you know, the Jonathan loves David. David loves Jonathan. And I've even heard a perversion of this where some people try to say, well, it's a homosexual relationship. You know, get your head out of the dirt. You know, this is about two men who genuinely are committed in a relationship of deep friendship. And, and, and David and Jonathan, it says that it came about that when that he'd heard, uh, finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was the king, that, that was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as he loved himself. There's just a genuine relationship between these two men who are, you know, it's, your God's my God, you know, I'll die for you if necessary. Genuine close friendships that are throughout the Word of God. There's another of Daniel and a, a Shadrach and a Meshach and Abednego. Well, I'll talk about them in just a moment. But one of my favorite friendships, and you talk about biblical, godly Christian friendships, when you, when you see that story in, in the book of Mark chapter 2 about the paralytic man that his friends got together and they, they carried him to where Jesus was. And of course, they couldn't get him to Jesus because the crowd was so great. So they drug him up to the roof and tore away the roof and lured him into the presence. Now that's friendship, amen. That's the, I, I hope you have a friend or friends like that because that's the kind of friends you need. Unfortunately, People are surrounding themselves with the kind of friends that are just the opposite of that. They're not the kind that are going to carry you to Jesus, get you in the presence of Christ. They're, they're those ruinous, tragic relationships, and the Bible does have those. We see Delilah and Samson. We know what an uh, energetic, powerful, spiritual force she was in his life. But not for the glory of God. Amen. You have Ahab and Jezebel. We did a series on them. And there's David to Uriah. Well, this is the point where David lost all concept text of what friendship was. But that, that's what disobedience to God does. You get involved in sin, and then he turns on one of his very best friends, Uriah, and has a relationship with his wife. And then it goes from there that he sends Uriah to the front line to get killed in battle. That's not the kind of friend you need at that point in life, is it? And you have, an, uh, you have others where when you study the scripture, you'll see that there's some in there in regard to, let me push the right button here, I'll get down to my list here. Push it one time, I got off the, I got off the right button. Me and this little clicker are not soon to be friends. 
There's Judas to Jesus, and then there's Pharaoh's butler to Joseph. We all know that those were disastrous, and that, that is not the kind of person that you need as a friend. These are people without integrity in, in so many different ways, and they just miss the mark of what friendship is really supposed to be about. Now, if you're just thinking, oh, Pastor Joe's going to preach a sermon on friendship. Oh, great, you know, this sounds exciting. Hey, you need to understand that the people you surround yourself are, and, and who you surround yourself with are extremely important in your life. They'll either make you or they'll break you. Someone said, friends are like elevators. They're either going to take you up or they're going to let you down. And unfortunately, too many times, it's, it's people letting other people down. They're not being the kind of friend that they ought to be, and they're not being the kind of godly friend that they ought to be either. So I'm going to give you, I said, four things. And here, let me just give you the four points in case you die before I finish. <laughs> One, understand the power of influence. Two, we'll talk about discerning the character of others. Three, selecting your friends wisely. And four, you know, making the tough decisions because there are some tough decisions when you decide to really be mature in your life and decide to be uh, the kind of person God wants you to be in regard to the kind of relationships that you establish in your life. So let's look at the first one. And I believe this is one that is certainly misunderstood. And many Christians fail at this point because they just don't understand the power of influence. If you were there for part of our Ahab and Jezebel series on Wednesday night that we did, you saw the power of influence that Jezebel had over Ahab. What a manipulator she was and the, the ultimate narcissist. The whole world was about her and she would do anything and use anybody to get what she wanted. And we need to understand the power of influence. There are people like that. And when you look at this issue of influence, you have to understand that it's going to be negative or it's going to be positive. Proverbs 18 says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, why would it say a man of too many friends comes to ruin? Because if you're the kind of person who just makes friends with anybody and everybody, then you're going to surround yourself with a lot of people who are not going to be a righteous influence in your life. And I don't think we understand the power of influence. We don't understand the power of friendships. We don't understand the power of relationships. For if we did, I think we'd be much more cautious in who we took into our inner circles and, and made our friends and our, our BFF or what is it, you know, whatever it might be. We're living in a culture I, I don't even think understands what I'm talking about today. We're making such a light thing. I mean, we have Facebook. I mean, you're on Facebook. Don't raise your hands, please. I don't know who you are. <laughs> yeah, and, and you got friends. Some of you have thousand friends on Facebook. And I'll show you how shallow it is because in a moment, this friend can unfriend you with a click of a button. <laughs> you say something, you do something, you make some other friend's friend mad at somebody else's friend who's a friend of so-and-so, and they did something you didn't like to that friend, so you unfriend their friend that was a friend of your friend, who's your friend. <laughs> you know, just grow up. You look at these things and say, you know, the, Kathy was reading me a Facebook post the other night, and I thought, you realize what this lady's doing to you <laughs> by sharing you that, with this story? She is trying to get you to be bitter at this person she's writing about because she's bitter about her. You know, we just, you know, we just don't understand how, you know, how important this is. So we just, you know, we just friend, unfriend, tweet and retweet, untweet, whatever it might be. I don't know. We don't understand the power of it. Proverbs says, you know, we need to, we need to understand the wisdom of this. And Proverbs has a great deal to say about this because of the power of influence. If anybody ought to understand this, Christians ought to understand it because the Bible says we are people of influence. We're the salt of the earth, the scripture says, but if it becomes tasteless, we're unsalty. We lose our saltiness. We don't make any difference. It's good for nothing. It says we're the light of the world. We're to be seen of all men. What's it talking about there? We are here to, to, to obviously make a change to be the change makers, to be the, the, the factor within our world that, that, that sets a standard, that shows light, gives direction, makes a difference. I mean, if there's anything you want to say about salt and light is it makes a difference. It genuinely makes a big difference. I mean, just turn off the lights, all the lights in here, and try to get out of this room without stepping on somebody, falling over something. Hey, I hate to come in here during the week when the lights are off. I don't come in here without my cell phone, my little light on it, you know? Because <laughs> I'll, I'll bump into something, I'll run into the edge of the stage, and, you know, bruise something, fall over something, trip over something, because there's no light. And when there's no light, you're going to make all kinds of bad decisions. And when you surround yourself with people with no light, guess what kind of decisions you're going to make? 
So we need light, but we need to be the light. We need to surround ourselves with people who are salt and light as well. Why? Because it gets down to this power of influence issues. There's two things about it I want you to see. One is, first of all, we will influence others. Proverbs 27, like iron sharpens iron, so, a man's, so, so one man sharpens another. In other words, we're around people. We embrace people in our lives. They ought to be the kind of people who are going to influence us and make us sharp and make us better in life. That's the kind of people we need to make friends. I'm not talking about general acquaintances, people you say hi to even at church, you know. But I'm talking about real friends, those kind of people that you know that, that, that have your interest in your heart and mind in, in their lives and you have an interest in their heart and life that's genuine, you're that kind of friend that's there to make a difference, to be the encourager, that's going to pray for people, support people, lift people up, not talk about them, not, not tear them down. Ecclesiastes puts it profoundly this way, when it says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Now you get twice as much, right? For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. No, a lot of friends, a lot of acquaintances, but nobody's lifting you up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can you be warm alone? And if one can overpower him as alone, two can resist him, for a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. In other words, this power of influence means that we have this capacity to make a difference in people's lives and to have people around us that make a difference in our lives, this power of influence. But you have to understand, you know, we're, one, we're going to be the one who are the influencers or the other side of that is we can be the influence ease, all right? We are going to be influenced by other, by other people. There's a, there's a common uh, law of physics that basically says, you know, when two opposing forces meet or collide, the weakest one gives way. And that is so true in the, in the common walk of our life, in the common days of our life, you know, that if we're surrounding ourselves with people who don't have integrity or there's no real character in their life, guess what happens? It begins to affect and infect our lives and impact our lives, influence our lives in a negative way. We're not going to be the so-called all that we can be for the glory of God in our lives. It's going to cause a, a course of deterioration. We begin to give way. God had warned King Solomon that he shouldn't have many wives. He warned all the kings, don't take a bunch of wives for yourselves, you know, because they're going to influence you and make a difference in you. In fact, it says in 1 Kings 11, chapter 3, he had 700 wives. My first thought was, and this is the wisest guy in the world? I can't handle one hardly. 700 princesses, 300 concubines. What happened? And his wives turned his heart away. In other words, we're going to be around people, associate with people, bring people to the inner circle of our life, and they're going to influence us for positive, for the righteous, for godliness, for integrity, or they're not. They're going to influence us in the way that we should not and do not need to be influenced in our lives. That's why I say this power of influence, we need to understand just how it functions and how it operates. Boy, there's, there's, a, there's a clear picture of that in Psalms chapter 1. You see it, you know, how, how it influences our life by those who we surround ourselves with, by those who we make our close friends, by those who we listen to and take counsel from. Psalms 1 lays it out like this. Just the, the whole of Psalms, a few verses there, but especially these two verses. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Simple lesson here is how blessed is the man who's going to make his first friendship the word of God, and the living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his written living word for us. That's where the, the source of real life is going to come from. But if we don't, oh, well, you can't say how, you might say how unblessed is the man who does walk in, in, in this regard. In fact, you see real quick in, the, in, these, in these, this first verse here, the negative side of, of the practice of the blessed man. In other words, he's a blessed man, and here's what he doesn't do. It's good to see what he does do, but it's also good to pay attention to what he doesn't do. He's three... Three postures, uh, basically, are, are positions here that he takes. One, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't stand, first walking, now he stops. 
and he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. But what happens if you stop walking, you start standing pretty soon. Here's this man, the righteous, godly man, the blessed man. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. What happens to those who do those things? Well, then you say that's the unblessed man. That's the man who's not experienced the blessing of God and, and, and the grace of God on his life. Here's a guy who's ultimately, say, is in trouble. And he goes through these three stages of walk, stand, and sit. First of all, see how it works. See, he associates with the ungodly. He's walking with them, all right? And they become basically now his, his acquaintances. It's people he's surrounding himself with. And we have... In our world, there's people around us all the time that we have to be cautious about not just becoming even a close acquaintance with. It's one thing to know people and to pray for people and to care about people, but it's another thing when we talk about this friendship level, the Word of God has some serious things to say about what we do there. Does it mean I'm not friends with lost people in the guard of embracing them and caring about them, concern, and sharing them? Yeah, that's obvious. But when it comes to friendships... Be careful, because watch, watch the regression that takes place. First of all, he associates their acquaintance. Next thing, he's getting in with them. Now these friendship relationships are starting. He's starting to, 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 to acquaint with them. And what's he doing? In fact, the, you know, the Bible's real clear about what happens here. From friendship, it goes to fellowship. Now he's joining in with the scornful. So we've moved from acquaintance to a deepening relationship of friendships. And when you're sitting together, in a biblical sense, it has everything to do with deep relationships, with that word koinonia, which means to share in a common life in Scripture. We don't have anything in common with the life of the people that are being described here if we're the children of God. If we choose to do what he's saying a blessed man doesn't do, we choose to do that, then certainly there's this definite regression, this deterioration, and ultimately degeneration that takes place in our life. So the first step here, you want to know about relationship. One is understand the power of influence. You have influence. Are you using it for the glory of God? You have the ability, and you've been given a supernatural ability of influence because you're light and you're salt. You're the temple of God. Presence of God is in your life to make a powerful influence for the glory of God and for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. After understanding the power of influence, we need to be discerning. We need to be discerning about the character of other people. We need to learn to identify the character of people from a biblical perspective. And he gives us in Psalms chapter 1, as we look through this a little bit more, he gives us, you know, the, there are three relationships in there. He says, you need to avoid. And you need to avoid them for a reason. Because they are going to start this degenerative process in your life, and they're going to ruin your walk with God. They can't take away your salvation. They can certainly destroy you the fellowship that God intends for you to have with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, first of all, He talks about you. Listen, don't walk with the ungodly person. Clearly calls Him out here. I need to have enough spiritual fortitude, wisdom, and discretion and discernment in my life to be able to look at the crowd of people surrounding me in my life and say, that's an ungodly person, that's a godly person. Do you have that kind of discernment? And it basically, what is an ungodly person? Well, he says here, the ungodly person, put it this way, they're, they're un-God. Right? God's not a part of their lives. They just leave God out of their life. They, they live life as though really that God doesn't exist. The Bible talks about these people, there's no fear of God before their eyes. How many people, I mean, let's, 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 let's get real for a moment. How many people do you have in your, your circle of relationships and your circle of friendships how many people like that that, that are, you could classify as people who just, they're, they're, they're really ungodly? Oh, maybe they're not out, you know, getting drunk and partying and all that other stuff. But, you know, God's not really a part of their lives. They don't read the Word. They don't really, you know, go to church. They may go to church, but there's no close fellowship with Jesus. They don't pray. You know, they, they don't even think when it comes time to a meal, they don't even give thought to the fact they ought to bow their head and say, thank you for this food. It's just not part of their life. It's not the fabric of who they are. And that's what the Bible would call ungodly. And they will seek to influence you. How do they do that? The Bible says, don't listen to their counsel. If you have, and we all have people around our lives like this. But one thing you have to be, mark it down right now. One, they're not going to be my close friend. And number two, I'm not going to listen to what they have to say. Now, we are naturally rebellious. We're naturally stubborn, aren't we? 
So that when we're doing something that God doesn't want us to do, in our immaturity at different times, we'll go to people like this and ask for advice. I mean, we might even have family members that fall in this category. Because we'll find people who will agree with us. And you can always find somebody in this circle of friends, and this circle of influence, who will agree with you when you're wrong. Why? Because they're ungodly. They don't know how to give righteous counsel. Now, the second category he talks about is the sinner. Now, we all know it. The Bible talks about sinner and describes it as someone who misses the mark. Well, the mark is the righteousness of God. The mark is Jesus Christ, all right? That's who our goal and aim is to pursue and to be like, all right? The ultimate friend. That's who we want in our life. But sometimes, if we start walking you know, with, with the ungodly, Sooner or later, we'll find ourselves sitting around these people and listening to them and being a part of their lives. This is just the person who says, you know, I, you know I, I, I just don't quite live like I should, and I've chosen to live a life of rebellion against God. You know, Proverbs talks about these people when it says, there's a way that seems right unto man. They think they're right. But the end of that way is what? Is death and destruction, Proverbs 14, 12. Now, as this person, they're not going to try to so much influence you with your, your, their counsel. They're going to try to influence you, you with their action. Don't, do, not, you know, do not stand in the way of sinners. And the way here is more than just the path that they're in. And it obviously means that, but it also means their actions, the way that they live, the way that they respond, the way that they think. So what happens? First of all, we're trying to be influenced by what people are telling us, bad advice and bad counsel. And then we're now being influenced by what they do. The actions that they take. The third part is, is the scorners and the scoffers the, script, the scriptures talk about. And they're the people, you know, they, you could mark them down as the atheists. There, there's a lot of them in the world, aren't there? They just, you know, they don't, have, they don't have any room for God. They reject God. They resist God. They don't want God. They want what they want. They don't want anything that God has for their life. You see these kind of people on TV and in movies, you know. They're, they're just what you would call the, 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 the scorner. And this is, he says you don't want to fellowship with these people. They just pretty much gets down to, they deny God. But not only do they deny them, these, when they say it's the scoffers and the scorners, there's an antagonism that they have for God. Do you have any people like that, you know? They don't want to hear about God. They don't even believe in God, many of them. They just, you know, it's just, it's just something about them. You know, it says, you know, atheists spend most of their time, you know, trying to, 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 to prove that God they hate doesn't exist. <laughs> Isn't that true? They hate him and they want to prove he doesn't exist. And, and they, they're, they're scorners. So we had the first group, the, 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 the ungodly, they want to they influence you by what? Their counsel. The sinner wants to influence you by his action. These people seek to influence you by intimidation or by arrogance. I'm smarter than you. You're stupid. I can't believe you believe that. You know, and they're just scorners and they're just scoffers. And God, God kind of has a place for these people of judgment. And the Bible says, you know what, you know, they're scoffing at me. Well, God says, you know, I scorn the scorners but I give grace to the, to the holy, to the humble, to the lowly. So God, you know, if they're going to scorn God. You know, you reap what you sow in this regard. But if we're going to be the people that God wants us to be, then you have to realize that, hey, most people, you know, there's motives that behind their relationships that we enter into people. Sometimes it's just to get something. Sometimes it's, it's to give something. In a positive way, that's good on both sides. That, you know, I, 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 want to, I want to be around godly people because I can get something that's going to help me. I'll walk in their counsel, be, be uh, led by their actions, and it won't be arrogance. It'll be blessing that I get from them. But there's that negative aspect. There's a lot of people who just want to use you. world's about them, rotates around them. You know, they, they're all turned inward, and they only pick friends on the basis of what that person can do for them in some way. Now, a person of integrity, on the other hand, they seek to influence others uh, because they want to bring something to the table. You know, they want to benefit the other person, not serve them up on the table. You know, they really want to be the, the, the kind of person who helps you. Mentors, disciples, is a part of your life and your walk with God. They're the ones who will call you and ask you about, what can I do for you? Is there something I can be praying for you? You know, they're the kind of people who show up when things are, are falling apart on you. But most people in most situations, there's usually motives, you know, behind friendships and behind relationships. And we need to be discerning. Some people will be really good to you just till they can get something from you. I remember seeing the cartoon of uh, this farmer, and he's got this big bucket of slop, and he's pouring it in the feed trough for his pigs. And all these pigs, you know, they're running up the trough and getting their faces in it, and just slop is flying everywhere. And, man, they're just, and the farmer's just putting out as much as they can handle. One little pig's at the end looks at another pig and says, she looks over the scene and he says, do you ever wonder why he's being so nice to us? 
There's a moment for consideration, is there not? When we need to take time and have a little discernment and see what is going on. There's two more points. I'll quickly get to these, because they're, but they are important. One is, you need, if this is all true, then you need to learn how to select your friends wisely. And it means there's choices to be made. After you've used some discernment, then choices have to be made. Proverbs 13 puts it this way. You walk with wise men, you'll be wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Choose not to walk with wise men, in other words, you're going to pay the price. Again, stop for a moment. List your closest people you associate with, your closest friendships and relationships. How many of those people you put in this category of foolish are as wise? Proverbs 22, verses 24, do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man. Why? You'll learn his ways. You'll find yourself snared as well. Now, the important word I want to focus on here is that, you know, you have to make choices. This is all about making some decisions. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, New Testament says, do not be deceived, bad companies corrupts, Good morals. So what does that mean? Well, put it this way. The Greek word for morals there is really the word for character. All right. In other words, you run around the wrong people, they're going to corrupt your character. They're going to corrupt your integrity. You will be like them. You don't have the courage to stand, then you're going to have problems. Galatians says, when Paul wrote the church because they started backsliding and believing lies, he said, you were running so well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who is it in my life that would hinder me from being what God wants me to be? I need to be discerning about that. I need to begin to realize that I have to make some wise decisions in my life to do, to be, and to go and to walk with those who are going to be righteous. Daniel's a great example. I mentioned him first, but let me tell you why I mentioned him. Daniel has some friends around him that, that are godly men. And you see them exercising godliness. I mean, they're told to bow down. They won't do it. They choose to be men of integrity when everybody else is. Bowing down, they refuse to. If you look at their names, when they were brought into Babylonian captivity, they changed the names of Daniels. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach's real name was Hananiah. His name means, his real name means God has favored. Meshach's real name was Mishael, which means who is what God is. Abednego's name, real name was Azariah, which means Jehovah has helped. And by the way, Daniel's name meant God is my judge. You're looking for some friends? These are the guys. All right? These are the people that you want to make friends with. How many, have you, how many of you have friends around you that say, hey, there's someone that God has blessed. They are favored by God. They're walking with God and God's blessing is on their life. Maybe they're, maybe they're Hananiah or Mishael or Meshach, whatever you want to call it, who, whose name means who is what God is. How many have people you can actually say about in your life? They're like Jesus. They're really wanting to be like, they're wanting to go on with God, they're wanting to serve God. How many of you have some real friends like that? This guy's serious about his walk with God. He's, it's not a game to him. I have some Azariahs in my life. In other words, Jehovah has helped. Hey, if there's anybody I want to hang around with, it's that guy. Because I need Jehovah to help me so I can learn something. I want this person to influence my life. Or friends like Daniel, whose name means that God is my judge. What kind of man is that? That's a man who has himself a clear understanding that he's an accountable person before God. That God sees and knows everything we say, everything we do, every action we make in our life. God is watching, and one day that man knows he's going to, have to stand before God and give an account of his deeds, his very words, his actions. But yet we, we, we just in our ignorance surround ourselves with people who are just the opposite of this. People just, anything comes out of their mouth, they just say anything and they think about it. They're critical, they're caustic, they're judgmental, they don't use discernment in their words or their actions or their deeds. That's not the kind of friends you need. These are the kind of people, the men and women you surround yourself with, you know, that are, are going to make a tremendous difference. And the last point is this, you have to be willing to make some tough decisions. As a very brand new Christian, when I got saved, I was dating a girl. All right? And uh, sent Kathy to the office. So. <laughs> and I thought I was in love. But the night that I found Jesus, I found real love. And I knew very clearly, nobody had to give me a seminar or preach a message on friendship. It's just something that the Bible says the Holy Spirit teaches things. So if you're a Christian, everything I'm sharing with you, you already know. It's just a matter of you getting in line with it. Amen? We know in our heart, and really preaching is me just telling you something you already know anyway, <laughs> but it's reminding you and encouraging you and, 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 and sometimes maybe reproving you. 
So I sat down with Renee the day after I got saved, and I said to her, you know, uh, you're not interested in giving your life to Christ? No. You're not interested in, 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 in making a, a life change? No. I said, well, you know, I'm serious about this decision I made for Jesus. And I know that uh, you and I have nothing in common anymore. And it's, we're just going to have to break this deal off. And that was, and I'll tell you, I didn't want to do it in my flesh. But I knew if I was going to be serious about what I just told God the night before about getting right with Him and following Him, serving with all my heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, that I was going to have to do the right thing here. And it wasn't going to help her, and certainly it wasn't going to help me. I knew that wasn't going to happen. And so many people, they're not just willing to make the hard choices, you know. Proverbs 22, we read this verse a while ago, where he said, do not, you know, associate with certain kinds. It's a clear word. These are, there are some things you don't do in Scripture. Because if you do those things, it's going to be detrimental. Do I not care about these people? Do I not? Yes, I do, and I pray, and I, and I hope and long and pray they come to Jesus. Amen? But we have to make choices in our life, and we make those choices based upon priorities. The most important relationship in my life and your life is your relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the work of the Holy Spirit in and through your life. James says, in fact, our relationship is a love relationship, so much so, he calls us adulterers and adulteresses if we choose to forsake our friendship with God and make friends of the world, the ungodly, the sinner, the scorner. He said, that's, 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 you know, if you're going to do that, he said, that becomes hostility towards God. If you, if you want to be friends of the world, you're going to make yourself the enemy of God. He's writing this to Christians, by the way. Because we can be so ignorant. And we just surround ourselves with people that are infecting our spiritual walk in life. And we wonder, why, why am I not walking with God? Why am I not close to Jesus? Why is not God answering my prayer? Why don't I have the power of God on my life? And many times it's because we've made ourselves open targets for the enemy through the relationships that we're carrying on our life. Samuel's a great illustration of making a tough choice. When Saul chose not to obey God, remember, and God said, I'm not done with Saul, it says that Samuel went to, to Ramah, and Saul went to the house of Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel came no more to see Saul to the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he'd made Saul the king over Israel. You know, God's mourning, Samuel's mourning, but the relationship is going nowhere. All right? This guy doesn't want to serve God. He doesn't want to be God's man. He doesn't want to be what God wants him to be. And so, you know, Samuel knows as the man of God, he's going to have to do what's necessary in his life and break off the influences that are not going to influence him for the better and for the righteousness and for the glory of God in his life. It's a great illustration in Scripture there. You have to come to the point you stand alone. The apostle Paul did. In 2 Timothy, he said, My first answer, nobody stood with me. But all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it not, not, not be laid to the church. Isn't it interesting that every one of these relationships that are broken off, there's a burden on the part of the Christian who broke the relationship off? But not, not a backsliding to go back and establish the relationship again. It takes discipline. It takes commitment. It takes, hey, I, that thing, that relationship is destroying my walk. Do I have enough discernment to see it? And am I willing to make the choice to do the right thing in this regard? Can I stand alone if necessary? Can I be what God wants me to be? I, I want to read you just a, a quick quote from Adrian Rogers, who's gone on to be with the Lord Jesus. And he's talking about the fact that, you know, that uh, we're different once we've come to Jesus and we always have to stand for truth. And he said, you know, it's better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. It is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that comforts and then kills. It's not love. And it is not friendship if we fail to declare the whole counsel of God. It is better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling and living a lie. It's impossible to find anyone in the Bible who has the power of God and for God who did not have enemies and was not hated. It is better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with a multitude. It's better to be ultimately succeeding with truth than to temporary, temporarily succeed with a lie. Will we be able to stand and make the hard decisions in our life? Paul wrote the Corinthian church in that great passage when he said, you know, what has the temple of God to do with idols? And, what, you know, and he, he asked this question. He said, what, what, how can we be bound together with other believers? What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? And what harmony has Christ with Belial? And what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of, of, of God 
with idols, for we are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will, I will be among them, I, I will be with them, I'll be their God, they should be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, be you separate, says the Lord. God says, hey, you have to make some clear distinctions in your life. It doesn't mean we just isolate, it means we insulate. It means we put on Jesus every day, and we're in a world of people who are ungodly, who are sinners, who are unbelievers, some who are scorners, and we live for Jesus brightly and boldly, making a difference. But we don't compromise our walk, and we don't compromise our life. He asked five questions in that passage. The first one was, what partnership? In other words, the answer is, none. <laughs> what partnership? And then he asked, he asked, what fellowship? The answer is, what? None. Third question, what harmony can Christ have with the devil? None. What does you have in common with unbelievers? Nothing. Fifth question. And what agreement can you have with these people? You're the temple of the living God. You're possessed by deity. So in other words, there can be no partnership. There can be no fellowship. There can be no harmony. There can be nothing in common. You know, what kind of agreement can you have? And this deals, well, this is a simple principle, you know, and, it's, and don't relate this to some arrogant, loveless kind of thing. No, it's not. I love people enough that are falling into those categories not to have fellowship with them so they can see my life and see I'm in business. And I've had to cut off some relationships in my life, and I'm sure that some of you have as well that were not righteous, and they weren't right, and they weren't God-honoring. 2 Thessalonians, and we command you, brethren, it's a command in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you keep aloof from every... You're talking about Christian brothers that are backslidden here. Who leads an unruly life? Not according to the tradition which you've received. You may know some Christians that are just backslidden. You don't need to be their best friend. You need to say, hey, I can't live that way. And if I live that way, I'm living a lie because that's not who I am, and I'm not going to live a lie. You know, I just can't live that way. Stand aloof. Do I pray for them? Yes. Do I love them? Yes. Do I care about them? Yes. Do I witness to them? Yes. But I stand apart. The character and the conduct of a true friend is found in 2 Timothy when Paul wrote to the, he said, I grant, may the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus. He often refreshed me. That's a good friend. He wasn't ashamed of my, of my chains. You know? well, when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me. He found me. And the Lord granted him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. This is the story of a man who just cared. This is the story of a man who went out of his way. In fact, this guy, you know, is one of the few guys that came and stood by Paul's side when everybody was forsaking him. Everybody loved Paul when all the good stuff was happening. He wasn't in jail. But as soon as the Romans took charge of him and he went to jail, boy, some of those guys who were behind him said, well, you know, Paul's in jail. I always thought he was a little strange. He's a legalist. He's radical. He's, you know, he's kind of over the top and over the edge. You know? What they're, what they're trying to say is he got out of the boat when I needed to. He chose to live a right, righteous life and I chose not to. He chose to go extra when I didn't want to do anything. It's the kind of friend that we need to be in our walk in life because that's the kind of friend that Jesus is. And the greatest friend you'll ever have. If you want to know who your best friend is and a real friend is, his name is Jesus. The Bible says there's no greater love than any man has for us, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus would say, you're my friends. How do I know you're my friends? Because you embraced my word, you kept my word, you believed the truth is what he's talking about here. So I don't call you slaves just because you obey. You're not slaves, you're my friends. You've realized that the truth of the word of God is the most liberating thing. You shall know the truth and it shall do what? Set you free. These people embraced the truth and obeyed the truth and they found freedom, but they found more than just freedom. They found the greatest friend they'd ever known. I mean, there's been times, folks, and every one of us will experience in our lives when we have to walk through and experience the friendship of Jesus because we're not experiencing it on any other level. Some of us will walk through dark times and dark days and dark valleys and nobody walks with us. We're surrounded even by good friends and people who care and people who say they know or perhaps they understand. And maybe on some level they do, but they're not where we are in that moment. But you know who is? I'll tell you who is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, whose parting words were, Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And good news, when the end of the age comes, he doesn't leave. He shows up in person. Hallelujah. Not just in spirit. He's the friend that is closer than the brother. He's the friend who will never forsake you. And all too often, we cannot say the same thing. All too often, we're the ones who are forsaking. All too often, we're the ones who are leaving him behind. All too often, we've made the bad choice, the wrong choice. 
chose to rebel. And how many times has God walked with you through that situation? In fact, there's been times I've done some really dumb things in my life. Some stupid stuff. You know what? Jesus came rushing in. He came rushing in with healing, with forgiveness, with grace. There were others who just said, I think we ought to just bury this guy before he dies, get over it. Ever been there? Yeah. But not Jesus. We, you know, we, we sing all these songs about the friendship of Jesus from the old hymns to the contemporary songs we sing about friendship with Jesus. But hey, I don't think these words and songs and hymns could ever really express what this kind of friendship is. Until we are in that place of isolation and we are in that place of darkness and we are in that place of desperation in our life and we're reaching out and we're just, in fact, we don't even know where to reach in those moments and Jesus shows up and reaches out his hand. I said I would be with you. But Lord, you don't know what I've done. I said I'd be with you to the end of the age. But Lord, I've lived in a way that mocks your name. If you'll confess your sins, I'll forgive you right here now. But Lord, you don't know, I paid the price. I paid the price for you to have freedom in your life. How's your friendship with Jesus? So well, I really don't have one. Then today, the Bible says he stands at the door and knocks, waiting to come in and sup. That's a word for friendship and relationship. God's been drawing you. God's been calling you. And how often have you slammed the door in his face and said, I don't have time for you. I don't need you. In reality, that's your greatest need in life. Why don't you just open up your life today and say, Jesus, I welcome you to my life. Not just to be my friend, but to be my Lord, my Savior, my Deliverer, my Redeemer. I need to be forgiven. I need to be cleansed. I need to be, I need to be saved. Save me today. And you'll discover a brand new relationship. If you'll keep it as the primary priority relationship of your life, you can be that Psalms 1 guy who's blessed by the presence of God in your life. I mean, you won't go through difficulties, but you'll still find the grace and the blessing of God in those difficult times. Blessed is the man. Choices have to be made. Difficult choices. Some of you here as Christians, and you hardly say amen to the fact that Jesus is your friend. But how many friends do you have today that would probably just leave your side if you paid attention to them like you've been paying attention to Jesus? Not a lot of acknowledgement's been going on. Not a lot of time with him. Not time to listen. Not time to share. Not time to study. No time to hear from God. It's kind of tacked onto your life like power windows are to the car that you want to upgrade. And you're missing the beauty of this whole thing of Christianity. This fellowship. This is the message we've had, heard, said John. We've seen. We've touched. We've handled him. And our message to you is that you can have fellowship with him too. Where is he in your life? As a Christian, I would encourage you today, if there's things that have hindered, or you may put even people in friendships before your friendship with him, get it right today. Make the tough choice. Would you stand with your head bowed?